Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The House of Hatchet by Robert Block Daisy and I were enjoying one of our usual quarrels. It started over the insurance policy this time, but after we threshed that out, we went into the regular routine. Both of us had our cues down perfectly. Why don't you go out and get a job like other men instead of sitting around the house pounding a typewriter all day? You knew I was a writer when I married you. If you were so hot to hitch up with a professional man, you ought to have married that broken down intern you ran around with. You know, where he was all day, out practicing surgery by dissecting hamburgers in that chili parlor down the street. Oh, you needn't be so sarcastic. At least George would do his best to be a good provider. I'll say he would. He provided me with a lot of laughs ever since I met him. That's the trouble with you. You and your superior attitude think you're better than anybody else. Here we are practically starving, and you have to pay installments on a new car just to show off to your movie friends. And on top of that, you go and take out a big policy on me just to be able to brag about how you're protecting your family. I wish I had married George. At least he'd bring home some of the hamburgers to eat when he finished work. What do you expect me to live on? Use carbon paper and old typewriter ribbons? Well, how the devil can I help it if the stuff doesn't sell? I figured on that contract deal, but it fell through. You're the one that's always beefing about money. Who do you think I am? The goose that laid the golden egg? You've been laying plenty of eggs with those last stories you sent out. Funny, very funny. But I'm getting just a little tired of your second act dialogue, Daisy. So I've noticed. You'd like to change partners and dance, I suppose. Perhaps you'd rather exchange a little sparkling repartee with that Jean Corey. Oh, I've noticed the way you hung around her that night over at Ed's place. You couldn't have got much closer without turning into a corset. Now listen, you leave Jean's name out of this. Oh, I'm supposed to leave Jean's name out of it? Your wife mustn't take the name of your girlfriend in vain. Well, darling, I always knew you were a swift worker, but I didn't think it had gone that far. Have you told her that she's your inspiration yet? Damn it, Daisy. Why must you go twisting around everything I say? Why don't you insure her too? Bigamy insurance. You could probably get a policy issued by Brigham Young. Oh, turn it off, will you? A fine act to headline our anniversary, I must say. Anniversary? Today's May 18th, isn't it? May 18th? Yeah, here, shrew. Why, honey, it's a necklace. Yeah, just a little dividend on the bonds of matrimony. Honey, you bought this for me with all your bills and, and, never mind that. And quit gasping in my ear, will you? You sound like little Eva before they hoist her up with the ropes. Darling, it's so beautiful. Here. Ah, oh, Daisy. Now see what you've done? Made me forget where we left off quarreling. Oh, well. Our anniversary. And to think I forgot. Well, I didn't, Daisy. Yes? I've been thinking. That is, well, I'm just a sentimental cuss at heart, and I was sort of wondering if you'd like to hop in the car and... Take a run out along the Prentice Road? You mean like that day we eloped? Mmm. Of course, darling, I'd love to. Oh, honey, where did you get this necklace? That's how it was, just one of those things. Daisy and I, holding our daily sparring match. Usually it kept us in trim. Today, though, I began to get the feeling that we had overtrained. We'd quarreled that way for months. On and off. I don't know why. I wouldn't be able to define incompatibility if I saw it on my divorce papers. I was broken. Daisy was a shrew. Let it go at that. But I felt pretty clever when I dragged out my violin for the hearts and flowers. Anniversary, necklace, retracing the honeymoon route. 
it all added up. I'd found a way to keep Daisy quiet without stuffing a mop into her mouth. She was sentimentally happy and I was self-congratulatory as we climbed into the car and headed up Wilshire Boulevard towards Prentice Road. We still had a lot to say to each other, but in repetition it would be merely nauseating. When Daisy felt good, she went in for baby talk, which struck me as being out of character. But for a while, we were both happy. I began to kid myself that it was just like old times. We really were the same two kids running away on our crazy elopement. Daisy had just gotten off from the beauty parlor and I'd just sold my script series to the agency and we were running down to Vallow's to get married. It was the same spring weather, the same road, and Daisy snuggled close to me in the same old way. But it wasn't the same. Daisy wasn't a kid anymore. There were no lines in her face, but there was a rasp in her voice. She hadn't taken on any weight, but she'd taken on a load of querulous ideas. I was different too. Those first few radio sales had set the place. I began to run around with big shots, and that cost money. Only lately, I hadn't made any sales, and the damn expenses kept piling up. And every time I tried to get any work done at the house, there was Daisy, nagging away. Why did we have to buy a new car? Why did we have to pay so much rent? Why such an insurance policy? Why did I buy three suits? So, I buy her a necklace and she shuts up. There's a woman's logic for you. Oh well, I figured today I'd forget it. Forget the bills. Forget her nagging, forget Jean. Though that last was going to be hard. Jean was quiet and she had a private income. And she thought baby talk was silly. Oh well. We drove on to Prentice Road and took the old familiar route. I stopped my little stream of consciousness act and tried to get into the mood. Daisy was happy. No doubt of that. We'd packed an overnight bag and without mentioning it we both knew We'd stay at the hotel in Vows, just as we had three years ago when we were married. Three years of drab, nagging, monotony. But I wasn't going to think about that. Better to think about Daisy's pretty blonde curls gleaming in the afternoon sunshine. To think about the pretty green hills doing ditto, the afternoon ditto. It was spring, the spring of three years ago, and all life lay before us, down the white concrete road that curved around the hills, to strange heights of achievement beyond. So we drove, unblithly enough. She pointed out the signs and I nodded, or grunted, or said, "Uh uh-huh. And the first thing I knew, we were four hours on the road, and it was getting past afternoon, and I wanted to get out and stretch my legs, and besides, there it lay. I couldn't have missed the banner, even if I had, there was Daisy squealing in my car. Oh, honey, look! The sign read, Can you take it? The House of Terror was a genuine, authentic, haunted house. And in smaller lettering, beneath further enticements were listed, See the Kluva Mansion. Visit the haunted chamber. See the axe used by the mad killer. Do the dead return. Visit the House of Terror. Only genuine attraction of its kind. Admission, 25 cents. Of course, I didn't read all this while slashing by at 60 miles per hour. We pulled up as Daisy tugged my shoulder, and while she read, I looked at the large, rambling frame building. It looked like dozens of others we passed on the road. Houses occupied by swamis and mediums and yogi psychologists, for this was the lunatic fringe where the quacks fed on the tourist trade. But there was a fellow with a little novelty. He had something a bit different. That's what I thought. But Daisy evidently thought a lot more. Oh, honey, let's go in. What? I'm so stiff from all this driving. And besides, maybe they sell hot dogs inside or something, and I'm hungry. Well, that was Daisy. Daisy the sadist. Daisy the horror movie fan. She didn't fool me for a minute. I knew all about my wife's pretty little taste. She was a thrill addict. Shortly after our marriage, she let down the bars and started reading the more lurid murder trial news aloud to me at breakfast. She began to leave ghastly magazines around the house. Pretty soon, she was dragging me to all the mystery pictures. Just another one of her annoying habits. I could close my eyes at any time and conjure up the drone of her voice, tense with latent excitement as she read about the Cleveland torso slayings or the latest hatchet killing. Evidently, 
Nothing was too synthetic for her taste. Here was an old shack that in its palmiest days was no better than a tenement house for goats. A dump with a lurid sideshow banner flung in front of the porch and still she had to go in to the haunted house. Maybe that's what had happened to our marriage. I would have pleased her better by going around the house in a black mask, purring like Bella Lugosi with bronchitis and caressing her with a hatchet. I attempted to convey some of the pathos of my thoughts and the way I replied. What the blazes? But it was a losing battle. Daisy had her hand on the car door. There was a smile on her face, a smile that did queer things to her lips. I used to see that smile when she read the murder news. It reminded me unpleasantly of a hungry cast expression while creeping up on a robin. She was a shrew and she was a sadist. But what of it? This was a second honeymoon. No time to spoil things just when I'd fix matters up. Kill half an hour here and then on to the hotel in Valos. Come on! I jerked out of my musings to find Daisy halfway up the porch. I locked the car, pocketed the keys, joined her before the dingy door. It was getting misty in the late afternoon and the clouds rolled over the sun. Daisy knocked impatiently. The door opened, slowly, after a long pause, in the best haunted house tradition. This was the cue for a sinister face to poke itself out and emit a greasy chuckle. Daisy was just itching for that, I knew. Instead, she got W.C. Fields. Well, not quite. The proboscis was smaller and not so red. The cheeks were thinner, too. But the check suit, the squint, the jowls, and above all that, step right up gentleman voice were all in the tradition. Oh, come in, come in. Welcome to Kluwa Mansion, my friends. Welcome. The cigar fingered us forward. Twenty-five cents, please. Thank you. There we were in the dark hallway. It really was dark, and there certainly was a musty enough odor. But I knew damn well the house wasn't haunted by anything but cockroaches. Our comic friend would have to do some pretty loud talking to convince me. But then, this was Daisy's show. It's a little late, but I guess I've got time to show you around. Just took a party through about 15 minutes ago. Big party from San Diego. They drove all the way up just to see the Kluva mansion. So I can assure you, you're getting your money's worth. All right, buddy. Cut out the assuring. And let's get this over with. Trot out your zombies. Give Daisy a good shock with an electric battery or something and we'll get out of here. Just, what is this haunted house and how did you happen to come by it? Asked Daisy. One of those original questions she was always thinking up. She was brilliant like that all the time. Just full of surprises. Well... It's like this, lady. Lots of folks ask me that, and I'm only too glad to tell them. This house was built by Ivan Kluva. Don't know if you remember him or not. Russian movie director. Came over here about 23 in the old silent days, right after DeMille began to get popular with his spectacle pictures. Kluva was an epic man, had quite a European reputation, so they gave him a contract. He put up this place, lived here with his wife, Aren't many folks left in the movie colony that remember old Ivan Kluva? He never really got to direct anything either. First thing he did was to mix himself up with a lot of foreign cults. This was way back, remember? Hollywood had some queer birds then. Prohibition and a lot of wild parties. Dope addicts, all kinds of scandals, and some stuff that never did get out. There was a bunch of devil worshippers and mystics too. Not like these fakes down the road. Genuine article. Kluwa got in with them. I guess he was a little crazy or got that way. Because one night, after some kind of gathering here, he murdered his wife. In the upstairs room, on a kind of an altar he rigged up. He just took a hatchet to her and hacked off her head. Then he disappeared. The police looked in a couple of days later. They found her, of course. But they never did locate Kluva. Maybe he jumped off the cliffs behind the house. Maybe. I've heard stories. He killed her as a sort of sacrifice, so he could go away. Some of the cult members were grilled, and they had a lot of wild stories about worshipping things or being that granted boons to those who gave them human sacrifices, such boons as going away from Earth. Oh, it was crazy enough, I guess. But the police did find a damn funny statue behind the altar that they didn't like and never showed around and they burned a lot of books and things they got hold of here. 
Also, they chased that cult out of California. All this corny chatter rolled out in a drone and I winced. Now, I'm only a two-bit gag writer myself, but I was thinking that if I went in for such things, I could improvise a better story than this poorly told yarn and I could add a little bit more effectively than this bird seemed able to do with daily practice. It sounded so stale, so flat, so unconvincing. The rottenest thriller plot in the world. Or, it struck me then, perhaps the story was true. Maybe this was the solution. After all, there were no supernatural elements yet. Just a dizzy Russian devil worshipper murdering his wife with a hatchet. It happens once in a while, psychopathology is full of such records. And why not? Our comic friend merely bought the house after the murder, cooked up his hot yarn and capitalized. Evidently, my guess was correct because old Buglebeak sounded off again. And so, my friends, the deserted Kluwa mansion remained alone and untenanted. Not utterly untenanted, though. There was the ghost. Yes, the ghost of Mrs. Kluwa, the lady in white. Fooey. Always it had to be the lady in white. Why not in pink for a change or green? Lady in white? Sounds like a burlesque headliner. And so did our spieler. He was trying to push his voice down into his fat stomach and make it impressive. Every night she walks the upper corridor to the murder chamber. Her slit throat shines in the moonlight as she lays her head once again on the bloodstained block, again receives the fatal blow and with a groan of torment disappears into thin air. Hot air, you mean, buddy. Oh, said Daisy, she would. I say the house was deserted for years, but there were tramps, vagrants, who broke in from time to time to stay the nights. They stayed that night and longer, because in the morning they were always found on the murder block with their throats chopped by the murder axe. I wanted to say, actually, but then I have my better side. Daisy was enjoying this, so her tongue was almost hanging out. After a while, nobody would come here. Even the tramps shunned the spot. The real estate people couldn't sell it. Then I rented I knew the story would attract visitors, and frankly, I'm a businessman. Thanks for telling me, brother. I thought you were a fake. And now, you'd like to see the murder chamber? Just follow me, please. Up the stairs, right this way. I've kept everything just as it always was, and I'm sure you'll be more than interested in. Daisy pinched me on the dark stairway. Oh, sugar, aren't you thrilled? I don't like to be called sugar. And the idea of Daisy actually finding something thrilling in this utterly ridiculous farce was almost nauseating. For a moment, I could have murdered her myself. Maybe Kluva had something there at that. The stairs creaked and the dusty windows allowed a sepulcher light to creep across the moldy floor as we followed the waddling showman down the black hallway. A wind seemed to have sprung up outside. And the house shook before it, groaning in torment. Daisy giggled nervously. In the movie show, she always twisted my lapel buttons off once the monster came into the room where the girl was sleeping. She was like that now, hysterical. I felt as excited as a stuffed herring in a pawn shop. W.C. opened the door down the hall and fumbled around inside. A moment later, he reappeared, carrying a candle and beckoned us to enter the room. Well, that was a little better. Showed some imagination anyway. The candle was effective in the gathering darkness. It caught blotches of shadow over the wall and caused shapes to creep in the corners. Here we are, he almost whispered. And there we were. Now, I'm not psychic. I'm not even highly imaginative. When Orson Welles is yammering on the radio, I'm down at the hamburger stand, listening to the latest swing music. But when I entered that room, I knew that it, at least, wasn't a fake. The air reeked of murder. The shadows ruled over domain of death. It was cold in here, cold as a charnel house. And the candlelight fell on the great bed in the corner, then moved to the center of the room and covered a monstrous bulk, the murder block. It was something like an altar at that. There was a niche in the wall behind it, and I could almost imagine a statue being placed there. What kind of statue? A black bat? Inverted and crucified? Devil worshippers used that, didn't they? Or was it another and more horrible kind of idol? The police had destroyed it, but the block was still there, and the candlelight, I saw the stains. 
that trickled over the rough sides. Daisy moved closer to me, and I could feel her tremble. Clue was chamber, a man with an axe, holding a terrified woman across the block. The strength of inspired madness in his eyes and in his hands an axe. It was here on the night of January 12, 1924, that Ivan Kluva murdered his wife with. The fat man stood by the door, chanting out his listless refrain. But for some reason, I listened to every word. Here in this room, those words were real. They weren't scareheads on a sideshow banner. Here in the darkness, they had meaning. A man and his wife and murder. Death is just a word you read in the newspaper. But some days it becomes real, dreadfully real. Something the worm whispers in your ear as they chew. Murder is a word too. It is the power of death. And sometimes there are men who exercise that power, like gods. Men who kill are like gods. They take away life. There is something cosmically obscene about the thought. A shot fired in a drunken frenzy. A blow struck in anger. Bayonet plunged into the madness of war. An accident? A car crash? These things are part of life. But a man, any man, who lives with the thought of death, who thinks and plans a deliberate, cold-blooded murder? To sit there at the supper table, looking at his wife and saying, 12 o'clock. You have five more hours to live, my dear. Five more hours. Nobody knows that. Your friends don't know it. Even you don't know it. No one knows except myself. Myself and death. I am death. Yes, I am death to you. I shall numb your body and your brain. I shall be your lord and master. You are born. You have lived only for the single supreme moment that I shall command your fate. You exist only that I may kill you. Yes, it was obscene. And then this block and a hatchet. Come upstairs, dear. And his thoughts grinning behind the words. Up the dark stairs to the dark room with a block and hatchet waited. I wondered if he hated her. No, I suppose not. And if the story was true, he had sacrificed her for a purpose. She was just the most handy, the most convenient person to sacrifice. He must have had blood like the water under the polar peaks. It was a room that did it, not the story. I could feel him in the room, and I could feel her. Yes, that was funny. Now I could feel her. Not as a being, not as a tangible presence, but as a force. A restless force, something that stirred in back of me before I turned my head. Something hiding in the deeper shadows. Something in the bloodstained block. A chained spirit. Here I died. I ended here. One minute I was alive, unsuspecting. The next found me gripped by the ultimate horror of death. The hatchet came down across my throat, so full of life, and sliced it out. Now I wait. I wait for others, for there is nothing left to me but revenge. I am not a person any longer, nor a spirit. I am merely a force, a force created as I felt my life slip away from my throat. For at that moment, I knew but one feeling with my entire dying being, a feeling of utter cosmic hatred. Hatred at the sudden injustice of what had happened to me. The force was born then when I died. It is all that is left of me, hatred. Now I wait and sometimes I have a chance to let the hatred escape by killing another. I can feel the hatred rise, wax, grow strong. Then for a brief moment I rise, wax, grow strong, feel real again, touch the hem of life's robe, which once I wore. Only by surrendering to my dark hate can I survive in death. And so I lurk, lurk here in this room. Stay too long and I shall return. Then in the darkness I seek your throat and the blade bites and I test again the ecstasy of reality. The old Drizzle Plus was elaborating his story, but I couldn't hear him from my thoughts. Then not at once he flashed something out across my line of vision, something that was like a stark shadow against the candlelight. It was a hatchet. I felt, rather than heard, when Daisy went, Ooh, besides me. Looking down, I stared into two blue mirrors of terror that were her eyes. I thought plenty, and what her imaginings had been, I could guess. The old bird was stolid enough, but he brandished that hatchet, that hatchet with the rusty blade in it, 
got so I couldn't look at anything else but the jagged edge of the hatchet. I couldn't hear or see or think anything. There was that hatchet, the symbol of death. There was the real crux of the story. Not in the man or the woman, but in that tiny razor edge line. That razor edge was really death. That razor edge spelled doom to all living things. Nothing in the world was greater than that razor edge. No brain, no power, no love, no hate could withstand it. And it swooped out in the man's hand. And I tore my eyes away and looked at Daisy, at anything, just to keep the black thought down. And I saw Daisy, her face that of a tortured Medusa. Then she slumped. I caught her. Beaglebeak looked up with genuine surprise. My wife's fainted, I said. He just blinked. Didn't know what the score was at first. And a minute later, I could swear. He was just a little bit pleased. He thought his story had done it, I suppose. Well, this changed all plans. No Valos, no drive before supper. Any place around here where she can lie down, I asked. No, not in this room. My wife's bedroom is down the hall, said Buglebeak. His wife's bedroom? But no one stayed here after dark, he had said. The damned old fake. This was no time for quibbling. I carried Daisy into the room, down the hall, shaved her wrist. Shall I send my wife up to take care of her? Asked the now solicitous showman. Now don't bother. Let me handle her. She gets these things every so often. Hysteria, no. But she'll have to rest a while. He shuffled down the hall and I sat there cursing. Damn the woman. It was just like her. But too late to alter circumstances now. I decided to let her sleep it off. I went downstairs in the darkness, groping my way, and I was only halfway down when I heard a familiar pattering strike the roof. Sure enough, a typical West Coast heavy dew was falling. Fine thing, too, dark as pitch outside. Well, there was a setup, splendid melodrama background. I had been dragged to movies for years, and it was always the same as this. The young couple caught in a haunted house by a thunderstorm. The mysterious evil caretaker. Well, maybe he wasn't, but he'd have to do until a better one came along. The haunted room, the fainting girl asleep and helpless in the bedroom. Enter, Boris Karloff dressed in three pounds of nose putty. Err, says Boris. Hey, says the girl. What's that? Shots Inspector Two's Fuddy from downstairs and then a mad chase. Bang, bang. And Boris Karloff falls down into an open manhole. Girl gets frightened. Boy gets girl. Formula. I thought it was pretty clever when I turned on the burlesque thought pattern. But when I got down to the foot of the stairs, I knew that I was playing hide and seek with my thoughts. Something dark and cold was creeping around in my brain. And I was trying hard to avoid it. Something to do with Ivan Kluva and his wife and the haunted room, and the hatchet. Suppose there was a ghost, and Daisy was lying up there alone, and... Ham and eggs? What the... I turned around. There was Buglebeak at the foot of the stairs. I said, would you care for some ham and eggs? Looks pretty bad outside, and so long as the missus is resting, I thought maybe you'd like to join the wife and me in the little supper. I could have kissed him, nose and all. We went into the back. Missus was just what you'd expect. Thin woman in her middle forties wearing a patient look. The place was quite cozy, though. She had fixed up several rooms as living quarters. I began to have a little more respect for Buglebeak. Poor showman though he was, he seemed to be making a living in a rather novel way. And his wife was an excellent cook. The rain thundered down. Something about a little lighted room in the middle of a storm that makes you feel good inside. Confidential. Mrs. Keenan, Buglebeak introduced himself as Homer Keenan, Suggested that I might take a little brandy up to Daisy. I demurred, but Keenan perked up his ears and nose at the mention of brandy and suggested we have a little. The little proved to be half-gallon jug of fair peach brandy, and we filled our glasses. As the meal progressed, we filled them again and again. The liquor helped to chase that dark thought away, or almost away. But it still bothered me, and so I got Homer Keenan into talking. Better boring conversation than a boring thought. Boring little black beetle of thought chewing away in your brain. So, after the carny folded, I got out from under, put over a little deal in Tia and cleaned up, but the missus kind of wanted to settle down. Tent business in this country's all shot to blazes anyway. Well, I knew this fine burger from the old days, like I say, and 
He put me up to this house. Yeah, sure, that part is genuine enough. There was an Ivan Kluva, and he did kill his wife here. Block and axe genuine, too. I got a state permit to keep him. Museum, this is. But the ghost story, of course, that's just a fake. Gets them in, though. Some weekends we play to capacity crowds, 10 hours a day. Makes a nice thing of it. We live here. Say, let's have another nip of brandy. What do you say? Come on, it won't hurt you. Get it from a mex down the road a ways. Fire. Fire in the blood. What did he mean the ghost story was fake? When I went into that room, I smelled murder. I thought his thoughts, and then I thought hers. Her hate was in that room. And if it wasn't a ghost, what was it? Somehow it all tied in with that black thought I had buzzing in my head. That damn black thought all mixed up with the axe and hate. Poor Daisy lying up there helpless. Fire in my head. Brandy fire. But not enough. I could still think of Daisy. And all at once something blind gripped me. And I was afraid and I trembled all over and I couldn't wait. Thinking of her like that all low in the room. Near the murder room and the block and the hatchet. I knew I must go to her. I couldn't stand the horrid suspicion. I got up like a fool, mumbled something about looking after and ran up the black staircase. I was trembling, trembling until I reached her bedside and saw how peacefully she lay there. Her sleep was quite untroubled. She was even smiling. She didn't know. She wasn't afraid of ghosts and hatchets. Looking at her, I felt utterly ridiculous. But I did stare down at her for a long time until I regained control of myself once again. When I went downstairs to lick her, had hit me, and I felt drunk. The thought was gone from my brain now, and I was beginning to experience relief. Keenan had refilled my glass for me, and when I gulped it down, he followed suit and immediately poured again. This time we sat down to a real gab fest. I began to talk. I felt like an unwinding top. Everything began to spin out of my throat. I told him about my life, my career, such as it was, my romance with Daisy, even... Just felt like it, the liquor. Before you knew it, I was pulling a true confession of my own with all the trimmings. How things stood with Daisy and me, our foolish quarrels, her nagging, her touchiness about things like our car and the insurance, and Jean Corey. I was model enough to be petty. I picked on her habits. Then I began to talk about this trip of ours and my plans for a second honeymoon. It was the only instinct that shut me up before becoming actually disgusting. Keenan adopted an older man of the world attitude, but he finally broke down enough to mention a few of his wife's salient deficiencies. What I told him about Daisy's love for the horrors prompted him to tease his wife concerning her own timidity. It developed that while she knew the story was a fake, she still shied away from venturing upstairs after nightfall, just as though she thought the ghosts were real. Mrs. Keenan bridled. She denied everything. Why, she'd go upstairs any time at all. Any time at all. How about now? It's almost midnight. Why not go up and take a cup of coffee to that poor sick woman? Keenan sounded like somebody advising Little Red Riding Hood to go see her grandmother. Don't bother, I assured him. The rain's dying down. I'll go up and get her and we'll be on our way. We've got to get to Valos, you know. Think I'm afraid? Mrs. Keenan was already doing things with a coffee pot. Rather dizzily, but she managed. You men, always talking about your wives. I'll show you. She took the cup, then arched her back eloquently as she passed Keenan and disappeared in the hallway. I got an urge. Sobriety rushed to my head. Keenan and I whispered, what is it? Keenan, we must stop her. What for? You ever gone upstairs at night? Of course not. Why should I? I'll dust you up there. Must keep it that way for customers. Never go up. Then how do you know the story isn't true? I talk fast, very. What? I say perhaps there is a ghost. Oh, go on. Keenan, I tell you, I felt something up there. You're so used to the place you didn't notice, but I felt it. A woman's hate, Keenan. A woman's hate. I was almost screaming. I dragged him from his chair and tried to push him into the hall. I had to stop her somehow. I was afraid. That room is filled with menace. 
quickly explained my thoughts of the afternoon concerning the dead woman, surprised and slain so that she died only with a great hate forming a life left her. A hate that endured, that thrived on death alone, a hate embodied that would take up the murder hatchet and slay. Stop your wife, Keenan, I screamed. Stop her. What about your wife, chuckled the showman. Besides, and he leered drunkenly, I'll tell you something I wasn't going to tell. It's all fake, he winked. I still pushed him towards the staircase. All a fake, he wheezed. Not only ghost part, but there never was an Ivan Kluwa. There was no wife. There was no killing. Just the old butcher's block. Hatchet's my hatchet. No murder, no ghost. Nothing to be afraid of. Good joke. Make myself honest dollar. All a fake. Come on, I screamed. The black thought came back, and it sang in my brain, and I tried to drag him up the stairs, knowing it was too late, but still, I had to do something. And then she screamed. I heard it. She was running out of the room down the hall, and at the head of the stairs, she screamed again. But the scream turned into a gurgle. It was black up there, but out of the blackness tottered her silhouette. Down the stairs she rolled. Bump, bump, bump. Same sound as a rubber ball. But she was a woman. She ended up at the bottom of the stairs with the axe still stuck in her throat. Right there I should have turned and run. But that thing inside my head wouldn't let me. I just stood there as Keenan looked down at the body of his wife. And I babbled it all out again. I hated her. You don't understand how those little things count. And Jean's waiting. There was the insurance if I did it at Valos, no one would ever know. Here was accident, but better. There is no ghost, Keenan mumbled. He didn't even hear me. There is no ghost. I stared at the slashed throat. When I saw the hatchet and she fainted, it came over me. I could get you drunk, carry her out, and you'd never know. What killed my wife, he whispered. There is no ghost. I thought again of my theory of a woman's hate surviving death and existing thereafter only with an urge to slay. I thought of that hate embodied, grabbing up a hatchet and slaying, saw Mrs. Keenan fall, then glanced up at the darkness of the hall as the grinning song in my brain rose, forcing me to speak. There is a ghost now, I whispered. You see, the second time I went up to see Daisy, I killed her with this hatchet.